Thank you for being here. You're here on a special day, I'll tell you that. Why is it not working, Josie? <laughs> they don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment. You've got to follow the social distancing rule. And some nuff dicks were getting tested, they're going in and doing a shop. <laughs> COVID. I had it. Detective so, George Bennett. Yeah, he's a ballin, absolutely. George, don't say hello to you. Like I don't know, I'm, I'm actually genuinely embarrassed. I broke my back. A vertebrae or, or oh. a portion? Spinal. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, jo- Josie, just do that Do that thing where you just put Bill's talking. Let me see I can hear him first. G'day, guys. Welcome back. We, we've... We're a Bennett short again. George is once again not showing up, but he has got a fair excuse. It's his last night in New Zealand. Well, his last night at home in New Zealand before he goes to the Nationals. So I think he's having a family dinner, so he couldn't make the show. But we have got another Bennett. Arguably a better Bennett. A better Bennett, I'd say. <laughs> Sam Bennett. Green jersey winner at the Tour de France 2020. So, buddy, good to have you here, mate. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. How was things? Mate, we just wrapped it. You're a more reliable Bennett than George Bennett because, yeah, okay, is is a fair excuse, you know. Last night in New Zealand, he's a, he's a big family man and that, but uh, you know, we we would have re- re- requested. It. I mean, it's one hour out of his day, Bills. Yeah, one hour. Yeah. Even, even if you're there with a family for a dinner, you can say to him, guys, sorry, I got this podcast, caught it, kind of a big deal in New Zealand. You've all listened to it. Yeah, you get it. All right, I'll be back in an hour. They're not going to care. And it pays big bucks as well, so I'm surprised he's not here. Huge. You know, he's, he's missing out on his bonuses. Well, we can't <laughs> often pay people cash, but we can uh, give them connections for resorts, particularly in the Maldives. And uh, it's it's paid dividends because Sam's felt this huge level of guilt, and now he's come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Got a free holiday, oh, not free holiday, but a good discount on a holiday, so I won't complain. <laughs> Mate, how was the resort? Because, um, you know, we gave that resort so many awesome plugs on this show for that $10,000 prize. Um, and we, we've heard since the plugs on social distance, I mean, you, you, it's just booked out. I mean, the uptake's been huge. <laughs> uh, no, in, in fairness, it's, uh, it's a once in a lifetime type of trip. Um, like uh, the Amilla Resort, but um, yeah, Jason and Victoria they looked after me so well there. But uh, it's it was absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the place. Well, we've Wait, got some a, vision. Look at that. What Look a time! That. What a timely holiday as well. Like after twenty twenty, such a garbage year as we all know for most people with COVID and uncertainty about races. Then when we did race, you had. Well, arguably the best season you've ever had, won the Green Jesus at Tour de France. And then you got to go and spend a few days in the in the Maldives after to unwind. Bloody great timing for a, for a holiday, I suppose. Yeah, and the thing was, I was like, because I didn't know I was doing the Vuelta until uh, a week or two before, I didn't have time to book a holiday. And then I was just talking to George and during it, I was like, oh man, I'd love to get on a holiday, stressful year. And then he said, oh, I might, I might know somebody who could, uh, who, who could hook you up. And then like, Within a week, I was going to the Maldives. It was, it was awesome. Great way to end the year. <laughs> Mate, on that year, I mean, what a what a season. I mean, the, the Tour de France was obviously the pinnacle. Um, what, what was better, winning your first stage or winning the last stage in green on the Champs? I'd have to say the last day on the Champs-Élysées in the green. Um, but they're both like reasons. Um, and, like the first one, like, yeah, it was overwhelming. Like I, I just didn't know how to react, and I ended up being like crybaby on TV, which yeah, get a bit of stick sick from the lads from time to time. But uh, yeah, no, the last one I have to say was uh, like the dream. Like I never thought I'd be able to win that stage. I thought it was outside my capabilities, and then the green jersey on top of that was something that I I, I never even planned on trying to get because I just thought it was so far out of my reach and capabilities that I'd never get it. So. Yeah, I'd have to say the last one. <laughs> well, you, yeah, I was, you, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that, Sam, because I remember when you took the green jersey. I think it was on stage three. The next day, or a day or two later, I was out the arse with you in the Groupetto, which <clears throat> where I spent most of my time at the Tour de France. But um, I remember talking to you about the green jersey, saying, "Oh, what's the plan?" And you were like, "Oh, I'm just gonna enjoy it while while I can," because I think at that point um, there wasn't probably many sprinters in the world that thought they could win the green jersey. Because when you look 
you know, back over the last 10 years, it's just been dominated by Sagan or, you know, Bling won it that year when Sagan was DQ'd. And there hasn't been a pure sprinter win the green jersey since Cavan 2011. So you're the first since 2011 to do so. And I guess now it's sort of set that precedent that actually sprinters still can do it. This year was a hard, well, last year was a hard tour. It was still a lot of mountain stages, still those opportunities for Sagan to take points, but he didn't. So now it's it sort of makes it more realistic for you guys, pure sprinters, to to start winning green jerseys again each year. Yeah, I think so. But um, the, the other thing was, it was just like, it was, it was something that I didn't go for. And then I just kind of kept chipping away some idiots and just like, I wasn't really fully going for for them but I just kept collecting all of a sudden I found myself in the green jersey and I was like okay I, I'll see how far I can take this then all of a sudden I was in the last week I was like holy shit I could actually win this thing like <laughs> and but uh yeah like I, I and the thing was is like there's so many new guys coming through like you have um Walt Van Aert and um Vanderpool like if those guys start going for it as well who are really quick and have a big engine, it's going to be hard because it's like having nearly three Peter Sagan's going for it, um, like the same style of rider. It might be the only opportunity I'll get, but I think now after this year, after getting it, I think a lot more people will go for it as well because they see that it is doable. Um, but yeah, it's just going to make it harder next year. <laughs> Does it add a fair bit of stress when you do start going, all right, we want to win this? Because I remember in 2012 when Green Edge first started, you know, they had green in the name. So I thought, oh, shit, we should win the green jersey. And it cooked the team, you know, trying to every day go for intermediates. And, you know, Gossie was under the pump. Whereas if they had no pressure, just going, oh, well, if we win a stage or we just take it as it comes, you know, generally you're probably going to have better results because you don't have that stress and that daily pressure. Um, yeah, like to be honest, it was definitely like a yeah, it was definitely a new experience. But like normally in Grand Tours, I only go for sprints at the end of certain stages, and then for the mountain stages, okay, it's not that I'm taking it easy. I'm still on my limit most of the time. I uh, trying to get inside time limit, but the mental stress of having to to get a result on that day isn't there so you're kind of mentally not switched on for racing but with the green jersey there was mark and peter out of it at the at the start of the race making sure he doesn't get in any breaks marking the right guys then the intermediate sprint and then the final sprint at, uh, on on other days so there's kind of like some days there's three tasks throughout the day and it was just a lot more workload when you add it up throughout three weeks or really two weeks because it wasn't until the last two weeks i fully started going for it but there was just uh, extra work that I wasn't used to. So then I was going against the green jersey riders and the pure sprinters who weren't going for the green jersey. So it was kind of killing the legs. And then the stress of it, man, the last week, I think mm. I was sleeping three to five hours a night um, just because like, it was within reach and I didn't want to mess it up because like, it was the first time really I saw how much teams put into it i see like what you were just saying about uh, green edge like and i saw my team as well the whole team were backing me um and staying with me in the mountains helped me in the in the intermediates and i could see boar doing the same for peter where they try and really make the race hard and i was talking to some of the guys on board because a lot of them were mate, are mates of mine and they were they were they were wrecked after the second week um so i can yeah, it definitely adds stress and it's something that like yeah, I, I get tired thinking about having to go for it again this year if I do have to go for it. <laughs> was the worst part about the pandemic, like in any other year you win the green jersey, you could fill any pub in Ireland with one of the biggest <laughs> celebrations ever. But, I mean, what, what were you able to do with all the restrictions when, when you got home? Man, I didn't even go home until December. And it's actually one of my biggest regrets after the tour because... Like, there was such an atmosphere at home. I was getting all these pictures, and they had a little parade around my hometown um, with all the cars, uh, with all the tricolors and uh, jerseys. And it was a great atmosphere. And it was, it was like, it was really funny to see, like, people enjoying it as much as I enjoyed it. Because I forget that sport is a form of entertainment. I, I just think of it as work uh, these days. But uh, I definitely wish I went home the week after. Uh but yeah, I didn't. I, I stayed here and I did one uh, post tour um, crit, uh, which nearly killed me. 
Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I just did a, it was, it was something new, but I had a full week of interviews, which was, yeah, I'm not used to doing that after a grand tour. So, yeah, I, I should have gone home and enjoyed the atmosphere. But um, I think when I had more races to do, I was kind of trying to stay switched on and not get sick with the pandemic. And, yeah, it was, it was just a strange year. Like, um, there's sometimes in the tour that it was so quiet on the roadsides. And we're used to that, like, with races like UAE and stuff like that. But then you think about it, it's like, man, this is the Tour de France and most of the roads are quiet here. It was, it was a strange year, but I, I wish I got to get home. It, it would have been it would have been quite fun, I think. I, I think the, the first stage of the Tour this year where we had really any sort of feeling that it was the Tour de France with crowds was the first stage you won in stage 10, wasn't it? I remember that was the stage I crashed out in, actually, so um, I don't remember much much else about the Tour de France other than watching it on TV. But um, I remember that stage, there was there was people on the road. There was as we got where, wherever we were in France there on the uh, west coast, and it was it was it seemed it seemed Tour de France for me that stage, and then obviously there was a couple of massive pileups, which was also pretty Tour de France, mm -hmm. and then it was, and then thankfully it was the first stage you won, so that quite cool that you won at least you won your first stage on a day that felt a bit like the tour, historical Tour de France, I guess. Yeah, um, I think I think the, the the stress that on that day really made it feel like a, a Tour de France day, with the crosswinds, a lot of crosswind paranoia going on that day. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a real Tour de France stage that day. I think um, you had the the guys wanted to go for the stage, and then the GC guys trying to go for the is trying to stay uh, in contention as well, not crash out, which made it more nervous. But uh, yeah, I think that was one of the first days along with the first stage, actually. Um, that really felt like the tour. How much of a monkey off your back is it finally breaking through and winning a Tour de France stage? Like, a lot of riders just dream of racing it, but then when you start going, hang on, shit, I could probably jag a stage here. How much confidence then do you go, well, if I can achieve that, like, bring on 2021 and, and so forth? Um, I don't know. Like, it's, it was a weird one because... I, as a sprinter, I think I started winning in Grand Tours pretty late. Like a lot of like pure sprinters start winning in Grand Tours around 24. Nowadays, like with Caleb, I think 21 and Gaviria around 20. Um, so I was pretty late. Um, and then when I started kind of getting better as a sprinter, then I was kind of like, oh man, I want to win a stage in the Tour before I start slowing down. Before I hit 30, like I'm afraid I'm going to start getting slower now that I hit 30. Um, you do, so yeah. Like, I, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's my biggest fear. And I was like, man, I just feel I feel like I'm just getting here now, and I'm going to start getting slower. Um, so, yeah, to win the stage of the tour um, was definitely, yeah, it was a, a bit of a relief. But now I kind of have, like, I, I always, I'm always a guy that puts a lot of pressure on myself. So now I'm kind of thinking, hold up, now how how the hell do I do this again? Like, how am I actually going to win another stage? Or, like, people are going to expect me to try and go for the green again. I don't know, can I do it again? Like, mm. <laughs> but um, I think it does give me confidence that it can happen. But I'm sitting here thinking, like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I suppose, like, every sprint, I kind of look at it and go, how am I going to do this? But then in the end, once you're in the mix and once you're in there in the final, I don't know, something, a, a switch has flicked and uh, and then you just kind of go for it and it's okay. But sitting here now, I think, I don't know how I can do it again. <laughs> how, how much does the, the quick step effect have on sprinters? I mean, obviously you were winning races before you went to quick step when you were with Bora and you had a great team behind you and a good lead out, lead out in Bora. But go, going to quick step, you see how many sprinters go to quick step and, and go to the next level. You know, you had Viviani did the same thing. Cav, when he was there, well, Cav's back again now. Kittle, now you. Um, how much does the, the Wolfpack actually have an effect on? And do you actually like the, the term Wolfpack? <laughs> yeah. Be honest, be honest, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Sorry, Wolfpack. Um, ah, sure, it's a bit of crack, isn't it? Uh, I don't like it when people are howling at me, but uh, yeah. And also, we had to do one ad uh, for the Koenig, and they asked me to hell. Oh man, after I did it, like I was asking to delete it, they kept it. I don't know when that's going to come out. I, I hope oh, so it you're literally out. doing that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, that. Mate, said, I can't no, 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 wait no, for no. this. <laughs> but this is this is like over a year ago. It's like, don't ever show that to anyone. Like, they, 
<laughs> they had me do it like two or three times because the first time I did it, it wasn't long enough. The next time wasn't loud enough. So then I had to do a massive one and like do it for 20, 30 seconds. I was like, oh, oh man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want that to come out. But um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> what, what's the what's the quick tip of thick like? Oh yeah, one? yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think one part is the pressure that I don't want to be the first printer. Can we curse in this show? Or, yeah, fucking yeah, out. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be the first sprinter to come in and fuck it up. I don't want to be the first sprinter to come in and not win at the tour. So there's that pressure that, like, fuck, I don't want to be the first one that's just, a, like, that's, yeah, an imposter, like, it doesn't do the business. So there's that pressure. But in fairness, like, you have such a great team around you and the, su- the support, they do get you in position a lot more. Um so like it's just like if you're there more often, you have more of a chance to, to win more. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing that I didn't expect was, so in each each print, I found that there was a reference point of where I need to be positioned and the timing when to to sprint and when I need to be in a certain area. And I always kind of judged it off other guys. But then when it came to quick step, I found that I was that reference point. So then. Like if I fucked up the sprint, there's a, there's another three, four, five guys ready to take advantage of that, and that kind of built pressure. And then that was an also a different approach to the sprint to the sprints that I had to get used to. And I think I have to train the sprint a little bit more different uh, to be able to hold it longer. Um, <clears throat> as I was always a guy that was able to kick in the last minute and come around somebody. Uh, to go long, like to go 200 meters now there's so many guys that can beat each other now and there's so many guys that are quick 200 meters is far nowadays like you have to almost be dropped off at 150 to be guaranteed that nobody's going to come around you um so there was just it was all new but uh in general it does help you get there more and it's just a i don't know i suppose there is a, that um wolf pack effects where it gets you there and then also yeah, you, you want to be good. There's so many good guys there and you just end up kicking the shit out of each other in training. Yeah. Well, speaking of teammates, how's um, Novi adjusted to the wolf pack? Um, he looks more like a tip rat <laughs> rather than a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I he's settling in now. Uh, it took a year. Um, but no, 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 he's, he's good. Like the guys all like him and uh, they're starting to, to get used to the, to the mullet. Um, mm. They kind of realize that if you cut the mullet, he loses his powers. Mm. Um, that that's yeah, that's his uh, was it his Achilles heel? We cut that. His his strength is gone, so it must it must remain. <laughs> um, but no, it's, <laughs> he's getting on grand. Is it like a mate? Is it? Do they call it a mane on a wolf? What do they call it on a wolf? The, do they have? Yeah, it's a mane. Is it a mane? Was that yeah. a lion? No, well, I think wolves have got they got sort of manes, don't they? Well, German shepherds do. They look like wolves. Yeah. Mm. Oh. yeah. <laughs> 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 hey, um, in, other, in other breaking news, Bills, I see um, Sargon's got COVID. So he joins yeah. the illustrious ranks of Gaviria, Buley, mm. riders to develop COVID. Yeah. What advice can you give to Sargon? I don't know. Not a, just do relax. fuck all. Just yeah. put the feet it, up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Glad <laughs> I brought that up. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Dr. Anthony Fauci, mate. Oh, sh- That's should, another we turn- expert. should we turn to the business of cycling like the last step <laughs> no we should stay well yeah. away from that okay uh, what's right. the plan this year sam you go back to the tour um yeah hopefully go back to the tour um as if Cav does uh start winning like his old days um yeah oh, so, uh, <laughs> hopefully- oh, 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 let's be honest mate i think i think you're pretty safe i can't see cavendish in bennett out that'd um, be a big shock Mate, like, how many how many times have they have they said, "Oh, Cavs old uh, over," and then he comes back and starts, he, he wins four or six stages in the Tour de France. Yeah, like it's yeah, happened before. Like it has. He's a legend, though. It must yeah, be yeah. must be pretty good having him on the team, I suppose. Now, like, as I get, yeah, you know, not even arguably, he was he's basically the greatest sprinter that's ever existed, isn't, isn't he, in the sport? And then you, you know, as like one of the best sprinters in the world at the moment, it must be pretty cool having Cav there, as you know. 
bit of a mentor, I suppose, or someone to learn from, even though you, you, you know, you've sort of mastered the art of it a little bit, but nice to have someone like that on the team as well. Yeah, I think also you can see, like, kind of learn how he deals with, with pressure, I suppose. Um, he's one guy that set the bar so high for himself. He kept going back into the same position and was able to deal with it. And that's how he deals with media in general. He's, he's actually he's pretty cool to hang around. He, like he's not a guy that goes around with a, a massive ego. He likes a bit of banter with the guys and uh, he's, he's well able to take some shit. So, so he's good, good, <laughs> good, good, good crack. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, in other topics, uh, Tommy Brady, like 43 world's best athlete. Um, yeah, he, he's an absolute freak if you look at ageism. But the thing with cycling he's nowadays, 43. I mean, all these guns, he's 43. And he's just won his uh, – how many Super Bowls is that, Bill? Seven. 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 Yeah. And he's, he's, won spent... more, he's won more Super Bowls than any team has. Mm. Unbelievable. And the amount of coin he spends on his body, like I was reading up on all the things that he does, like – he does these insane training camps and he's got like his own personal physio and dietitians and uh, he, he does these brain games as well to keep himself mentally sharp where like, you know, the stuff your kids do like for fun, like, you know, that memory game. He's doing all this sort of shit so that on the field as well, mentally he's, he's sharp. So, You know what else it, he did? Mm -hmm. he has, before the Super Bowl the other day, his wife and kids left home for 12 days so he could be alone and focus on the Super Bowl. Have you ever considered kicking the missus out for a couple of weeks for the tour, Sam? Um, uh, <laughs> I, better be, I, better, I, I better be careful here. Yeah. Just say no. Just say no. Yeah. No, 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 never, never. No. And, no, and did, you, did you see that streak of bills that ran out onto the pitch in the last yeah. quarter? There's yeah. a conspiracy th theory going around. This streaker, right? He, he hit the field, and you know the broadcast. Uh, I love it when the streaker hits the field, and the cameraman works out it's a streak, and they go, "Shit, cut, quick, cut to a close up," and they don't show it for the rest of the game. But apparently, he put a, a fifty thousand dollar bet on that there'd be a streak on the game. It was paying seven fifty, so he collected three hundred and seventy five grand. He posted bail of five hundred bucks, so he's even after legal fees, he's going to come out about three hundred grand on top. So now they'll just ban streaking at the Super Bowl so that you can't replicate old mate. But we'll bloody ban betting, ban betting oh. on streaking. No, oh, oh yeah, betting on streaking as a whole, yeah, for sure. That'll I, definitely I just set found a out. I just found out what I'm going to do after cycling. Yeah, <laughs> you only have to do it yeah. once or twice. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, once a year. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, what's your next race, Sam? What's your program look like this year? Um, normally like UAE, Paris, Nice, San Remo. Um, that's kind of like my first block, or Gent Wavagum and uh, Shell de um, It's kind of like my first block. And uh, San Remo is a race that I always wanted to go uh, in peak condition just to see just to see what I can do, um, see how far I can get. Um, I've never actually got there in top form, and I think it's something that I could, I could definitely hang in over the Poggio, but... Uh, yeah, I'd just like to see if I could compete in the in the final K. Um, I got there once before, but I was just spent. Um, so trying to to hit the season with good form, but I think uh, yeah, the way the the world is now at the minute with the pandemics and stuff, everybody is. So uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Do you get a lot of um, obviously Irish cycling's had some pretty big names with you know Roach and uh, Sean Kelly and that. Have any of those guys been like mentors for you? Throughout the journey, this guy's like um, so. Sean is from the same hometown as I'm from, and um, when I was growing up, Sean Kelly was a sports center. Like I didn't really know who he was, so uh, it wasn't until like I went abroad with on um, post train reaction and stuff, and I went to like current Bustle Current and stuff like that, and I saw the race and I went to Paris. -Nice. I was like, holy shit! How many times did he win these races? Like all these mm. classics and the stage races. It wasn't until I was older that I realized what he had done. And then, um, yeah, when I knew really who he was, um, then, yeah, like I got a lot of advice from him. And, um, and he was always there whenever like things were down to help uh, pick me up and set, like, point me in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, he's good, he's good to have there. Um, Stephen, uh, I've never uh, – I've met him once or twice, but never really been in contact with him. 
um, was showing you uh, quite a bit, yeah. What's um, some of the best bits of advice he gave you in those, over those years? Um, it's always about money with him. <laughs> Go for the money. <laughs> don't, well, that's don't, good tell the, don't tell him about the streaking tactic then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is he showing out in the fucking GA pitch next week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. So yeah. just chase chase the coin, Jerry Maguire style. Chase, I like chase, it. Chase the coin. <laughs> did you cash in on the green jersey? Like, did you got a lot of um? You know, you're doing commercials in Ireland. You know, selling yeah. sort of green products and. <laughs> um, trying to get my name a bit more known in Ireland, kind of turn it into a sports figure instead of just a cyclist. That's the kind of whole marketing thing at mm. the minute. <laughs> But uh, yeah, just trying to become more of a household name so that I can do more stuff like that in Ireland. I think uh, I think it should be good for for cycling in general, actually, because um, it's uh, it's kind of got uh, a bit of a bad name from ten years, twenty years ago, uh, twenty mm. years ago now, um, and that's kind of stuck with it. And whenever it's on radio, it's about bad stuff, mm. and even like and there's some guys interviewers that are there and they kind of keep it rolling um so i'm trying to kind of i'm trying to just show that it, it is a clean sport it's a really clean sport and then and then that it can be done you know mm. um so just trying to change the opinion on it and make people like because cycling was massive when stephen roach and sean kelly were there so just trying to kind of change that um in general um don't think i can cash in too much <laughs> But um, hopefully, yeah, just kind of helps I can uh, give back. Like, just, yeah, even like for younger guys coming up, if, if I kind of change that opinion, then it'd be easier for guys coming up through the ranks as well. And that's the right approach. I mean, like, uh, we are the generation that's changing <coughs> changing the sport and showing that the sport is not what it was in the 90s, you know. And that's the, that's the right approach to do that, is to help young guys, you know, to, to just, just become like a – like you say, a sports figure of somebody who can offer advice, offer guidance, offer um, opportunities to young people, and then you know that's that's how we can we can grow our sport in general. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's like, and also just uh, to get people out, more people out on the bikes. Um, I think after the tour this year, there was uh, a, a lot more sales, and then also uh, I think pandemic has something to do with it. People looking to get out more, but uh, it's great to see that. Uh, Bike shops couldn't even couldn't even get couldn't get bikes through the door. They're already gone. Mm. I see Con- Conor McGregor's a bit of a cycling fan, isn't he? I've seen him doing a bit. He was in around Monaco during the tour, um, and he, he followed me on Twitter. That was one of my highlights. Oh the tour. <laughs> shit, that's bloody good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, but I was too nervous to message him or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, if he's, in the, if he's into the bikes, I'd be asking him to jump on the old local bunch ride and whatever. If you need to, yeah. if Sean Kelly was giving you advice, he'd be like, mate, you need to line yourself with this guy if you want to maximize the old cashola. Yeah, good bodyguard. That's it, actually, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah nobody For sure. off. <laughs> All right, mate. We'll, we'll let you go. I suppose you've got to go training. We've, uh... Yeah, oh, I'm putting it off now. I've horrible efforts today, so oh. never mind. <laughs> See, I told you it was the better Bennett. Committed to the point. Yeah. That's what we like to hear. Yeah. <laughs> George would go, oh, no, I've got to go, I've got to go. So, George would be cutting up. Yeah, yeah he'd be like, yeah. putting, his, putting his kit on, putting his socks on. Yeah. <laughs> but no, nah, buddy, awesome awesome to chat to you, mate. And um, good to hear that, uh, yeah, you had a great time at the Maldives in particular. Because uh, as we said, if you want to visit uh, Sam Bennett's old stomping ground, amilla.com. <laughs> and thanks again to Jason. <laughs> As a proper plug. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thanks for having me, guys. Good mate, on we'll you, mate. See, see you on a start line somewhere in the next few months, hopefully. Yeah. Good on you, mate. Sounds Take good. it easy. Hey, mate. Cheers. Hey, how, how is the hand, actually? Oh, it's getting there. It's still in a yeah. 16 weeks in a cast now. Coming up what? 16 weeks. Yeah. 16? But, yeah, all, I've been in a cast for not, uh, 12 weeks now since the operation in December. Um, and five weeks or something before that after the tour as well so it's been long man but i'll be back on the road i should be back on the road in two or three weeks so it'd be like you, four you months you haven't been out on the road no nah, i've been off the road for four months yeah. Fuck. so yeah, it's been a pain in the ass so hopefully i'll be back on the road by the end of the month and 
racing by the end of end of March or something like that. That's the that's the goal. So I've just been zwifting, man. Running, ran a half marathon actually the other day. Yeah. Did you? Fuck, man. Running, yeah. you get great bang for buck with that. Like I think that's oh, really, yeah. like like you just put on a pair of shoes, you're at the door in five minutes, and you get a great. Exactly. Yeah, I, he's doing more case than Forrest Gump old Bules now. He's loving it. <laughs> yeah. Are you Good stuff, right, mate. Uh, and, uh, all right. I'll let I'm you go. I'm enjoying it now. Oh, drone. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, you're on the altitude. Actually. You'll be fucking flying. Yeah. <laughs> should have. I should have gone to Colombia for four months. Yes. Yeah, fuck it out. Wouldn't recognize you when you come back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you're a good man. Thank you, Joe. See you, mate. Cheers. Sam Sam Bennett. I felt bad. We were sort of wrapping him up and he wanted to keep talking. We should have just let him stay on. How often do you get a guest that wants to stay? I don't know. I I panicked. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. You did panic. And it's one of those awkward when you cut him off halfway starting (laughs) a new sentence. So what else here? All right, mate. (laughs) Get off our show. We've got important stuff to talk about. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a legend, man. Like, uh, he's pretty – what I like about him, he's actually a real – he's actually a super modest guy. And you talked about it mm. a lot then, how, like, you know, he's he's still learning to deal with pressure and learning how to, you know, approach these scenarios where he's – um, you know, he is, like, the guy to watch. He said, like, you know, before he went to Quickstep, he was using other people as reference points. And now people are using him as a reference point. So, you know, adapting to all that pressure and – you know, like he won the green jersey and he's still like, oh man, I don't know how I'll do it again. You know, like he's really, mm. he's a good, he's a modest guy, but man, he's, he's fucking quick. That's for sure. Mm. And um, yeah, some of those insights were bloody fascinating. Like particularly when he was loosening up and dropping the F-bomb and talking about, as you said, like pressure, but you know, like things he regrets, like not going back to Ireland straight away and, and celebrating like, you know, the jersey and stuff like that. But it was such a, fucking weird year 2020 mm. like i was chatting to a few of the boys on sunday night after the nationals and um yeah you know, we'd sort of spoken about it a few times just the mental effect of 2020 on cyclists as a whole mm. like i mean it, it i don't think a lot of people are fully recovered because and he was talking about you know when he won his first stage and he got quite emotional i mean that was the norm any mm. rider that won a stage was coming in and bawling their eyes out. Like, that doesn't happen. There was this, um, because there's so much shit going on behind the scenes. Yeah, there's this comment, famous um, sports commentator in New Zealand. His name's Keith Quinn. He was he used to be the voice of um, uh, Jonah Loma Rugby on compu- on PC. The oh, that game. was a good game. Yeah. I remember that. He, so he was, he was like, he's retired now, I think, but he was sort of the voice of rugby for 30 or 40 years or whatever. Keith Quinn. And uh, he he put a tweet out this year saying like, oh, would everyone just all these sports people crying when they have victories? God, like, what's wrong with them? You know, stop. We don't need to see you guys crying. Everyone. Then he got he got attacked. Like, fuck you, man. Like, everyone's had a hard year, and you know, sports people. It's just like you say, Jonesy. It's just so much going on behind the scenes that when they do succeed, it's emotional. It's awesome. Who doesn't yeah. want to see emotions? What's wrong with it, Keith. I Quinn? know. I don't know. I think like that's the pro- that that's the main issue is people, particularly males, like you're stuck in this fucking macho bravado. You know, you've got to suck it up, harden up, all this bullshit. And I mm. think people nowadays are like, nah, that's that's not what you need to do. You need to fucking let it out, talk yeah. to people. So mm. who cares if you cry? Who cares? Like Cav was bawling his eyes out when he thought it was his last race, and he's fucking riding again this year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure no one at Quick Step gave him shit to his face. <laughs> uh, mate, it's it's it is yeah. Like there's nothing wrong with crying. No, nah. I mean I don't Sorry. do it because I'm a fucking hard hard ass. But otherwise, come on, mate. I've seen you after a few <laughs> sure bats. <laughs> hey, uh, we've got a we've got a good year and a um, legend or balland. I'm looking forward it... to stepping back into our regular segments. Yeah, actually. I know. Really and I feel I feel like the last step was one that we just it was an episode we had to have just to you know get mm. one under the belt. Whereas I feel like this week, unlike last time, we've done prep. You know, we've got a couple yeah. of good little things to touch on. Actually, I want to touch on one thing just going back to when we were talking about Tom Brady and the Super Bowl mm. and the streakers. Did you know that the Super Bowl performers don't get paid? Like yep. the halftime show? Yep. 
That's unbelievable, eh? I, I, I was thinking, oh, they must be getting paid a million bucks or whatever these um, rock stars get paid. They get paid nothing. They well, just do it for the publicity because mm. when when Lady Gaga performed in 2017, her sales went up a thousand percent the next the next day, and mm. they say on average, like the weekend who performed uh, on Sunday, the weekend mm. performed on the weekend, um, yep. they they reckon their sales have got four between four and six hundred percent the next day after the show. So that's where they're getting their money from. They what do it for free for that. What did you think of the halftime performance? Did you watch it? I did watch it. I watched it last night. I didn't mind it. I'm mm. I. Week the weekend's not really my kind of music, but I do like one or two of their songs. Um, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind. Oh, it. Oh, why didn't he bring in like they always bring in another band and do yeah, it, like, a cover or something? I thought that was a bit selfish. COVID maybe too mm. much work to test all these people. Ah, oh, but surely you could have brought in a, a solo artist just to mix it up. Or yeah. Daft Punk, had- Daft Punk wear masks all the time. You talk about Daft Punk having masks on his last couple of minutes of the show, he was out on the field and there was like, there would have been 150, 200 other people out there with him. And I was like thinking to myself, fucking COVID, like, did they test all these people? But they all had masks on. They had like a, it was like not not your standard surgical mask, but they had like a um, a costume and they all mm. had like masks on. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. Um, good idea. Yeah, it was a good idea. Just blending it into the, um, the fashion of it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I the, the, that bit in the middle when he was in the gold room, that was pretty good. Yeah, you know, that had, made like, me classic, Yeah, it was a bit too intense. Like yeah. when he was running around getting lost or whatever. Like, yeah. Like and I, I was floating around a fishbowl. Well, I was at a sports bar drinking CC and dries. And so I probably had four or five. And yeah, that was on the limit. And I was standing at this bar with like a massive screen. So, nah, I felt crook. But <laughs> I overall, I, I give it a six out of 10. It didn't blow me away. It was it, like Prince being a 10. Yeah. One being the Black Eyed Peas. Um, I was, was going to ask you middle. what. Your favorite halftime show is, but you answer with Prince. That's mine as well. Oh, mate, that story about when it pissed down rain and they're freaking out, going, uh, "We, uh, Prince, uh, we're worried that you're going to get electrocuted." He's like, "Nah, I hope it rains harder." And they're like, "Okay, okay carry on, Prince." He's like, "I'm playing Purple Rain in the rain." Yeah, it's that was and a good shredded show. it, shredded yeah. it. Yeah, and he was wearing He's... bloody high heels. Yeah, like it would have, it would have. Ta- it was like cake of soap. Playing yeah. an axe, it yeah. wouldn't take you much for him to go tip <laughs> up. He did a great job. He did a great job, all right. Um, hey, um, big big death news uh, last week. Uh, Mr. Peterson, who was the main suspect of the DB Cooper mystery bills, they're labelling this as one of the best unsolved FBI uh, mysteries of all time. Uh, I've already run you through the story, but for the listeners, in the uh, early seventies. This guy boarded a plane. He's wearing this suit, black tie. Uh, you know, it looked like a bit of a James Bond wannabe. And he hands the uh, air hostess a note, and she says, "Oh, thank you." And he orders a bourbon and soda. She puts the note in her pocket and goes to walk off. He goes, "Ah, oh, no, I think you need to read that note." And on the note, it says, uh, "I have a bomb. Please sit down next to me, and I'll run you through the next instructions." She sits down next to him, grabs the briefcase, shows, "All right, I got some sticks and some wires, and there's a timer there." So the host is like, "Oh shit." This guy means business. Gives her a list of demands. Go take this to the pilot. When you land, uh, I want two hundred thousand in twenty dollar bills. Uh, I want four parachutes, and if they, and then I want a refuel, and we're off to Mexico. If these demands aren't met, I'm going to blow the bloody plane up. So they do it, and then he lets the passengers off. They take off heading to Mexico, but then he opens, gets his bloody parachutes. So he's got the two hundred cash in his uh, briefcase. And fucking jumps out, like opens the door, <laughs> jumps out with his bloody parachute on. I mean, he didn't know if they go, oh, fuck this guy. Let's just poke holes in the chute. We're not letting him get in the way with this scot free. <laughs> Fully trusts the system. <laughs> fucking unclips his tie and puts these black goggles on, like a couple of Speedo ones that you cut 50 metre laps in. Jumps out in his full trenchy with his backpack oh, and told him, don't fly above 10,000 feet. Never seen again. And about five years later, some 20s wash up on shore. This kid finds it. So he didn't collect all the cash, but feels I can't help but think. And this guy, Mr. Peterson, was considered the main suspect um, because he was uh, a firefighter that parachuted into remote areas to tackle wildfires. And he had a, he loved skydiving. It's like, bang, it's got to be him. And um, 
he served as a Marine or whatever, and he did an um, he said in an article, the National Smoke Jumper Association's magazine. He said, "Oh, actually, the FBI had a good reason to suspect me." He wrote, "Friends and associates agreed that I was without a doubt DB Cooper." There are too many circumstances involved to be a coincidence. At the time, the heist, I was 44, and that was the same uh, age, or they reckon, of the guy that was in the plane. Um, but that feels like a lot of effort for 200K, even in 1972 bills. Oh, yeah, especially like now you just buy a fucking two Bitcoin and you have it next week. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, steal it. <laughs> but, like, what was he thinking? If you hold a briefcase, like, I've never jumped out of a plane before. A lot of people have. But I imagine the force... You, you gather some speed, some serious oh, speed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, what's terminal velocity? 160k an hour or something. So, like, yeah. there's every chance you get close to that. So he's jumped out of a plane with a briefcase. Well, do you think he's just going to hold on to it? Exactly. And also... Like, just going, <laughs> yeah. And then also, like, imagine um, jumping out with a trenchy. Like, it's freezing up there. <laughs> like, 10,000 feet. And you just got a trenchy with a, a briefcase and you're praying to God that... They haven't given you a dummy shoot. Like, there's too many fucking variables. Uh, 10,000 feet is actually not that high. It wouldn't be that cold. 3,000 metres. Is it? Yeah. Oh, it's still fresh. Yeah, fresh. You'd, need a, you'd, you'd want an undershirt. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, have that you actually, ever, What? Have you ever skydived? No. Nah, I don't think have I ever will. Have you got any ambitions? No. Nah. Seems like a lot of risk, eh, for the fuck or reward. Yeah, I'd, I think I told this story on the show once, didn't I? When I went skydiving and they charged <laughs> me that. F- oh, haven't I told you? <laughs> I, went, I went skydiving in America once and um, it was in Hawaii. And when we had to go, they showed us a 20 minute video of warning you may be killed or seriously injured skydiving. Would you, so be, you, you be seriously injured? <laughs> well, you can't start by saying you may be killed or, you know, less killed. <laughs> like I don't so, think I don't think there's an I don't think there's an injury option. I think it's you you live or you die, you know. Pretty much. If something goes wrong, like yeah, yeah. there's there's no like, oh yeah, graze me knee, parachute didn't open, but um, <laughs> I should be all right. So anyway, me and my mates, we were doing it and there was like a you had to there was a weight limit. Apparently if you weighed over two hundred pounds, you paid two dollars per pound, you were over two hundred. And so I thought, oh shit, that's like under 100 kilos, I've had a pretty big couple of years and stacked on a fair bit of weight. I reckon I'm going to be pushing 100 kegs. So I just wrote 198 pound on the form, hoping that I'd get away with it. That doesn't seem like the, that doesn't seem like the activity be aligned about your weight. <laughs> well, well, I didn't even think of that. It's not bungee jumping. They're not uncoiling based on your weight. Well, I mean, maybe, the shoot's either going to work or not. Maybe you need a heavy, more heavy duty shoot or I don't know. Well, so anyway, I put in the 198 and the lady looked at me and looked at me um, bitch tits and was like, nah, jump on the scales. And I was like, oh, fuck. And it was those old school scales where they tap, you know, when they, and it got to 200 and the thing was still on an angle. So she kept tapping two, five, oh shit, 210, 220 pound I weighed in at, which is 100 kilos. I'd never been 100 kilos in my life at, up until that point. And I remember thinking, oh, fuck. You know, I'm 100 kilos, and then I got charged $40 fat tax. And then they do this half-hour safety thing, so they pair you up with who you're going to go tandem with. And my two mates got a half-hour, you know, safety briefing with their guy, and then they go, all right, guys. And I'm going, where's my guy? I'm thinking, oh, surely he's going to come around sooner or later. He didn't, and they go, all right, let's get on the plane. And I said, excuse me, I haven't had a safety briefing yet. And they go, what? What's your name? I go, Daniel James. I looked at it, and they go, oh, shit. Hey, Sean! They yell out. And there's this little weedy dude. He's like, look like he should be racing ran races at Randwick, like a jockey. He's raking leaves. He's got like her headphones in. And he's going, What? And they go, Sean, you're jumping, man. It's like, oh shit. And he just drops the rake, chucks his harness shit on, throws me like a backpack, and I'm strapping shit. I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, Come on, man, let's go. So we fucking get on the plane and my mates are looking at me going, what the fuck, man? Like, you haven't given any instructions, nothing. And I'm about to jump out of the plane with this guy who's like half my weight. He's listening to music. And he, I said to him, mate, is there anything you want to tell me before we jump out of this fucking plane? He goes, <laughs> he goes oh, shit. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to strap you in. I was like, yeah, thank fuck. Thanks. <laughs> he goes, I'll, I'll strap you in. And when we jump out, you crush your arms. Tap you on the shoulder, throw your arms out. That's it, man. 
I go, what? That's it. And he goes, hey, man, even if you don't do that, we're going to have a fucking great time. Rock and roll. <laughs> I remember thinking, that's it. I'm fucking dead here. I'm <laughs> dead. We we get to jump out of the plane. My mates, I was going first. I looked at him and I thought, oh, well, throw out a fucking, this could be my last line. I, I just said to me, mate, see in hell, Johnny Utah, like off point break, you know, when he jumps <laughs> out. I jump out because this nuff dick didn't bloody um, type my goggles up. He's just thrown them on. First thing to go, boom, the goggles. Like they're just gone. And I'm like, I can't fucking see. I'm like losing control. Then he pulls the cord. And because it wasn't strapped in tight enough, bang, I took all the weight on my nuts. 100 kilos. I've got a split sandwich straight up the middle. <laughs> One nut, one nut either side, copping 100 kilos straight up the middle. I am in the worst fucking pain of my life. And I am just screaming, going, ah, ah, I'm in balls. And this guy's going, shit. He's behind me, he's going, shit, what's going on? I go, babe, I'm fucking nuts. I can't adjust it. I can't adjust it. So for five minutes going down, my nuts are just getting absolutely severed. And then we finally land, and I'm just like, I'm almost vomiting. I'm in that much pain. And the guy clips me off, and he goes, ah, oh, sorry, man, sorry. Oh, fuck, man. You know, that was, ah, oh, I don't know what to say. I was like, oh, fuck. He comes up to me 20 minutes later. He goes, hey, uh, just as a, as a going rate, uh, you know, we, we generally accept 20% uh, gratuity. I said, are you fucking serious? <laughs> After that experience, you want a tip. I'll give you a fucking tip, Sean. Stop breaking leaves. Check the fucking schedule. You see a group, there's a good chance you might have to take someone out. Do your fucking job, mate. You just walked off. So that was my experience skydiving. It was fucking horrific. So for people out there, make sure you're strapped in, you get proper safety, and just go with professionals. If you go to Hawaii and they take you out where they film Jurassic Park, turn the fucking bus around. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. No, yeah. I've, I've, I've never been skydiving. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, move, moving along. Um, this parachuting uh, con man, he's actually, it's a good segue into our year. So, we're going to do 2007. And uh, in 2007, there was this guy called John Darwin. He was a British dude. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, no, in the year 2000, this guy, John Darwin, went missing. So he went canoeing in the ocean off somewhere in England, and he uh, was never seen again. They found his they found his canoe, they found his paddle and all that stuff, but they never found him. And then in 2007, he walked into a police station in London and said, um, my name's John Darwin. I think I'm uh, like a missing person. And they'd already said he's, he was dead. Like they record him as, oh, never found him. He's drowned. He's, he's dead. So he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm John Darwin uh, seven years ago. You know, people said I died and went missing, but here I am. I'm I'm alive. And then they were like, "What the fuck? What? Well, all right, mate. Welcome, welcome back. I guess." And then uh, they and, and then they started thinking like the police are going, "This is weird. Like this is something fishy about this." So as they dove more and more into it, they started investigating it. And then they were like, "Oh, that day that he went canoeing was like that's a weird day to drown. It was like." still as like a mill the ocean was like a mill pond there was no wind they're like how could you like drown or that, yeah, anything it doesn't add make up. any sense <clears throat> and then they started getting these reports of these like some people went to the police station they're like oh yeah no i've met i met that bloke a couple of years ago they're like what do you mean you met this bloke a couple of years ago no one knows where he's been is it no he's running he was running a a homestay out in the country. So he, <laughs> he, his wife was like living in the main house and she, he was living in, the, in the, like the farm cottage and they were renting it out as a, like an Airbnb type setup. Jo and he was, jo Johnny's D's b and B. He was running it. And like apparently one day someone said to him like, mate, I recognize you. You're that guy that's, you know, no one's seen for seven years. He's like, yeah, yeah, don't tell anyone though. And the guy thought <laughs> he, kept, he kept it quiet. And then... <laughs> They went to Panama. They were Give me a five-star review on your way out. Thanks, <laughs> he went to um, – him and his wife flew to Panama and they went to buy a house and they got like a photo with the real estate agent and everything. And like the real estate agent was like, this hey, guy's like, hang on a second. And then so, yeah, it turns out that it was just an insurance scam, life insurance scam. They wanted to pay the mortgage off so they could run this <laughs> this homestay. But he was just, he was like living a normal life. Like he was going to the supermarket and shit. So what did he dob himself in? I guess I don't know. Maybe there was he. He must have thought like, oh, this 
there's too many leads to my existence. This yeah. is gonna this is gonna come out at some point. So maybe if I if I get ahead of the game and say like, oh, you guys thought I was missing, but I'm actually not. I'm alive. He might get away with it. Um, is, is there like a you know that in some crimes there's like that period where it expires? Is there like that double like not double jeopardy, but you know when they say, well, if you don't get caught within a period, it's oh like, yeah, um, like tax fraud and stuff. It's like mm. eight years, eight years or whatever. Mm. Um, what do they call that? It's I don't like, know. Yeah, I can't remember now. There is a name for it. But yeah, I know what yeah. you mean. I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so for insurance fraud. They went to jail, both of them, seven years. Yeah, I don't know. He, there's got to be a story. Someone must, that, someone must that, have threatened him. He did the same thing. for. It was for 200, basically for 200 grand. I think it was for 190,000 quid. He did it. So he, he went off the radar, well, loosely off the radar for seven years for 190,000 quid. That's the same as DB Cooper for two hundred grand. Like that's that's a lot of work for two hundred grand, eh? I know, I know. The people, I mean, two, the, the, the value, money, the, but... yeah, the value people put on two hundred k is unbelievable. It's that it's sort got... of sweet spot amount where people go, oh yeah, wouldn't but mind two hundred k. All you got to do is streak for thirty seconds at the Super Bowl and walk away three hundred and seventy. Exactly, exactly. I don't think you can do it anymore, unless, as um, Bennett said, you might see Sean Kelly storm the pitch. Uh, next week in uh, the local Irish league, but <laughs> other than that, there's a couple of good films in 07 Bills, Knocked Up, Super Bad, a couple of Judd Apatow bloody classics. Super Bad was good, I didn't like Knocked Up. I don't really like Seth Rogen or whatever his name is. Really? No, uh, it's just a bit goofy for me. Yeah, the comedy sort of wearing thin after a while, but um, Super, Super Bad's a belter like that. Yeah. And that was the birth of like um, he used to encourage ad lib scenes. So he'd literally say to him, "Okay, this is what we want out of the scene. Just fucking go for it. Let's just film mm. ten different takes, and they pick the best take." Um, and then yeah, he does that for like forty year old virgin, heaps of those films. And then um, I see Netflix was launched in two thousand seven. Yeah, J.K. Rowling finished her last Harry Potter book. Your mate J.K. Rowling. Oh, don't get me started on that chick. <laughs> um tesla the tesla car was introduced and i saw myspace at the time in 2007 was worth 65 billion and facebook was worth 1 billion so and you know myspace i oh know bebo actually i saw the other day bebo the guy that created bebo uh he sold that for 20 million or something to some company then it mm -hmm. went tits up when he bought it back for a million dollars last year and now he's trying to launch it again to rival facebook that's completely off topic for 2007 but just fitted in the myspace bubble uh hawke was introducing to tennis the doomsday clock was moved forward two minutes oh, and yeah. the iphone was released yeah the iphone was a big one and that's a good uh that's a good segue oh no hang on Bules. what's the top tracks from 2007 oh, yeah. a couple of notable deaths as well evil knievel died Oh yeah, and Andrew who's, Nicole a, who's Smith. a mad dog? Oh yeah. Um, oh, it was another, as you can imagine, um, another absolute garbage year for music. Top ten in two thousand and seven. Number ten, glamorous from Fergie. Yeah. Shit. Number nine, say it right, Nelly Furtado. Probably not no. too bad. I can't really remember it. Number eight, I want to love you, Akon. Shit. Hey mm. there, Delilah, playing white tees. That's a terrible song. Uh, Four, hey, is it Delilah? Oh, it's horrible. What you do to me? Oh. That's not bad. Not Ugh. a bad guitar sort of riff. <laughs> oh, Before agree he cheats. Agree to disagree. <laughs> agree to disagree. <laughs> Before he cheats, Carrie Underwood. Buy you a drink. T-Pain. Big Girls Don't Cry. Fergie. Not bad. Sweet. Oh, what is wrong with you, bro? La, 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 la. Oh, my God. Keith Quinn wouldn't be happy with Big Girls Don't Cry. That was a good um, film clip. Gwen Stefani, The Sweet Escape. That was actually not too bad. It was like a bit like upbeat. Uh, it sweet. Yep. Umbrella was number two from Rihanna and Irreplaceable mm. from Beyonce is number one. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a, that's a bad year. Let's be that's honest. That's horrible, yeah. yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely up. horrible. Right, a legend of Belland. Good yeah, segue from good the one. iPhone. Steve this Jobs. Yeah. The creator of the iPhone. Do you like how I linked those two? 2007 to Steve Jobs, Legend of Belling. Never doubted your talents, mate. After the no. last show, you were like, right, I'm going to really step it up this this app. 
We're yeah. back. And we're back. Yeah. Go on. Well, open the batting. Well, right, open, the, open the batting, right? A um, couple of good things he did, smart things he did. He was the largest shareholder in the Walt Disney Company after he purchased Pixar for $10 million in 1986, and he sold it back to them in 2006 for $7.4 billion. That's a very smart investment. Uh, he intervened on the Toy Story script, and he changed the character of Woody from a bad guy to a good one. Now, how would a Toy Story worked if Woody was an arsehole? It wouldn't. Really? Was that yep. the plan? He was going to be an arsehole, yeah. Bad he's character. Every, he's every childhood, every child's little hero. Woody. Exactly, yeah. No, he, he, that was all Steve Jobs. A um, couple of bad things he did, you know, he rarely showered. You know, he used to walk around barefoot. He didn't use deodorant. He absolutely reeked, I reckon, this guy. Um, he never put license plates on his cars and he mm. would often park in spots reserved for the handicapped. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, not, that, that's, that's not, not cricket. Good. So, you know, with the with the license plate thing, and, mm. and Steve Jobs was obviously, you know, the image that we all have of Steve Jobs and a pair of Levi jeans and New Balance shoes and a white T-shirt, you know, never showered, used to walk around at bare feet. Really, he was just not the epitome of wealth. He only, while he was at Apple, he uh, his annual salary was $1.00 only $1. Um, so he was never, he didn't seem wealth obsessed. But the number plate thing was fucking 100% the epitome of wealth. So there's a rule in California that if you don't, you don't have to put a number plate on your car until you've had the car for six months. So he would just buy a new Mercedes every six months. Boom, 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 boom. So he never had to put a license plate on it. Just so put then, fucking license plates on it, mate. So then how do red light cameras work? If you're just doing 180 through a red light camera, how do they track you down? I don't know, but you've got in California. Apparently, you, back then at least you had uh, what a you fucking had a, stupid six law. Months for, six months to put plates on a new car, so he would like, buy a new Mercedes every six months to avoid that. But it doesn't take six months to get plates. You no, know, it like it takes no, it a week. Why do they? Mac, why Max. do California? Why do California go, oh, no, no, that's, that's, that's a stressful process. We'll give you six months to sort that shit out. In fact, we'll make it law. Six months. Well, get it sorted. Every other country in the world, the, the car dealership does it for you. You can't drive off the lot without the plates. You yeah, buy exactly. the car, you pay the money, you go back two days later, you pick the car up with plates on, you drive out. Yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah. Um, did you see that story about when he lied to Steve Wozniak when he created that breakout game for Atari? <laughs> They get, oh, they gave yeah, he's like all his cash. Yeah, they gave him five grand. Instead of saying to Steve, who pretty much did all the work, all right, mate, we'll split it up the guts. He said, nah, mate, we only got like 1500 or whatever, so here's your 750 And he didn't find out till 10 years later. But the principle of the thing, I mean, yeah, that's a bit of a yeah. dog act. Another and thing he did, like he had so much cash. This, this company's worth so much money, and they had quite a few like charitable um, philanthropist programs, you know, that were – basically mm. funding charities and things like that. Steve Jobs cut them all. He said, no, yeah. get rid of them. Until the company starts making more money, we're not going to give any money to, to charity. They never, ever return those charities under his under his guidance. Even though the company was – they're currently – I can't remember the exact number, but I think Apple has something like $500 billion cash. It's more than any government in the world. But then I saw an article saying that he did he did do stuff that didn't want the publicity for it. Like he started that Red Foundation, which was about um, tackling the AIDS pandemic or whatever, and Bono was involved with it or whatever. But it was like 50 mil or something. Like, you know, they didn't maximise how much they could be giving back. But, yeah, he was very much like, you know, we're going to do our service for the community by making really good products. So, like, meh, if you're trying to help people with serious illness and that, don't know how an iPhone's going to really help that cause as much as what they need. Mm. Like he, he, I don't know. He's a funny dude, eh? Like obviously, like you can't really. He he's created the arguably the most important piece of technology. You know, okay, uh, is it important the phone? It is. People say, oh, I don't like fucking phones. Everyone's got a phone in their hand. They can't leave the phone phone behind for two seconds or whatever. That's true. But ultimately, like, the world runs now on because of the iPhone, you know? Mm, like, look, look at this last, the last 12 months. Everything's been done on virtual, without mm. phones, without MacBooks, without iPads. Um, what the fuck will we be doing, you know? So that you, you, you've got to give them. You've got to give them credit for that. But 
the fact that he didn't shower, you know, he when he was working at Atari, he was put on night shift because he didn't shower and he walked around in bare feet. And, you know, the fact that he didn't put number plates on his Mercedes, just fucking put number plates on your car, mate. Jesus Christ. Well, well the other disappointing... Handicaps places, that's not cool. The other disappointing thing is, is him and Bob Marley are similar in the sense that they both detected their cancers early. They both could have got treatment. They both refused treatment. And then when they finally worked out, shit, actually wouldn't mind hanging around. It was too late. Yeah. Like Bob Marley had a, a rare form of cancer under his big toenail. And mm. they said, we've got it early enough, but you're probably going to have to lose your foot. And he goes, nah, I'm not doing that. I like playing soccer. You know, I don't believe in that mm. shit anyway. And then by the mm. time it was too late, and he goes, all right, all right, I'll do whatever it takes. It's too late. Same with Steve Jobs. Like they reckon they got it nine months earlier or he refused treatment for nine months and said, you know, I was going to go on this um, strict, diet and do all this other weird stuff but obviously it didn't work and mm. it didn't that didn't that guy who took over the boss of apple he offered his was it his liver or something who um tim cook yeah he offered his um his uh, liver transplant really and he, yeah he knocked it back it's it's amazing actually like when you none of us would certainly you or i didn't know steve jobs personally and when you watch all these movies you know he comes across as he's just eccentric isn't he he's just on lsd and he's just creative he's just an artist um mm. but like ultimately like they kicked him out of his company for 10 years they you know like they you know he treated people like shit they felt bad but ultimately like everyone loved him you know like Tim Cook, who was going to take over it, he knew he was going to be the CEO of Apple. He knew he was going to be on a fucking $10 million salary. Mm. He was still willing to give his liver to, to Steve Jobs because he was an innovator, you know, he, and the company relied on Steve Jobs. When when they kicked him out of his company, eventually they all were like, we need to bring him back if we want this company to succeed. Like they all, for all his flaws, which seemed like quite a few, they all understood the importance of him to their company. Well, one of the best things I saw on Steve Jobs, and we used to use it all the time at Green Edge. And then I remember when uh, Mitchell and Scott took the yellow jersey with Yatesy for the detour, we thought, ah, we'll do a bit of a whip round tribute with that clip again. So I want to play two minutes of Steve Jobs summing up how to be successful. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is... Uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere. When, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you got to love it, you got to have passion. And I think that's the high order bit. The second thing is um, you've got to be, you've got to be a really good talent scout. Because no matter how smart you are, uh, you need a team of great people. And you've got to figure out how to, how to size people up fairly quickly, make decisions without knowing people too well, and hire them and you know, see how you do and refine your intuition and be able to, to help you know, build an organization that can eventually just you know, build itself. Because um, you need great people around you. Good stuff. Good. How can you call him a bellend after watching that, though? Well, I'm going to call him a bellend. Really? Yeah, I'll vote bellend. No, I'll vote legend. You know, oh. he's a pioneer. And without him, as you said, like we wouldn't have the iPhone as much as it, people shit mm. can at times. Yeah. I love I love my iPhone. He, he's a, he's a, I'm going to go back to the old one we had a number of weeks ago. I can't remember who we did. But I'm going to say he's a legend with bellend tendencies. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. And then I saw one other article. He sued a nine-year-old kid who um, wrote a negative um, piece, a negative blog about the a Apple products. Uh, and he also denied there. he had a daughter for fucking fifteen years. Yeah, didn't pay child support for the first bit. Lisa. Yeah, he's that's Name a dog. A computer app. after. Named like mm. the operating system after, didn't he? Yeah. 
And that did you see that um, Jobs movie with Ashton Kutcher? That mm. was that was shit. Yeah. So there's a there's a there's uh, a bit of shit things linked to him, but overall, legend with pretty good. legend with legend with Dallin tendencies. Right, yep. I, I'm going to go. Uh, I'll go skydiving. Okay, we'll make sure that uh, you get the right instructor, and yep. you'll be fine, mate. What do you guys? Tighten up the straps, particularly the ones around your Jets crackers. Yeah, I think we're, we're off. We're off and uh, racing now, Bills. Yeah, I think let's let's wish our uh, absent co-host George Bennett good luck for the nationals this weekend. Yep. Uh, hopefully, if he wins, we'll try to get him on the show as a guest one day. Mm. Um, but he, we'll, he's we'll... back in Europe next week, so if he's true to his word, he'll be back on the show next week as well. So stand by. All right, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, right. we will have some breaking news in a couple of weeks' time regarding merchandise. <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to finish the show on, on the shit. We're go, we're going so good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.